This video was sponsored by Brilliant. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of I had a big video project but it took several months and my video sponsor is getting impatient so you're getting a smaller video instead. Today I want to talk about a cool technique I use in Fluke, my experimental HTTP implementation written in Rust, focused on IO Uring and KTLS for performance. Now I'm extremely excited to begin to measure how performant Fluke actually is compared to something like Hyper, and then to optimize it to get it to beat something like Hyper, or fail to make it beat Hyper, and then have an in-depth exploration of why it's not actually faster, even though in theory it's making fewer system calls and being smarter about buffers, and I really, really hope it ends up being faster, but I'm using discipline this time, not the fun kind. It's just, there's no point in comparing the performance of two implementations if you're not sure they're both correct. Right now, I barely do any of the flow control stuff. If I benchmark now, it's probably gonna be fast. When I add flow control, it's probably gonna be slower. We've seen that a gazillion times on Twitter. Some dude is like, why the f is that tool slow? It shouldn't be slow. I can make a fast one, and then they make one, and it's fast, and everyone points out that their tool doesn't actually do all the things the old tool used to do, and they're like, whatever, I still won. Sometimes it does work out, though. Sometimes hubris pushes some Someone to rewrite something from scratch, certain they can do it better, and they do when society advances, and what pushes me forward in working on Fluke is like 20% hubris and 80% corporate sponsors. Fly.io generously funded work on Fluke for the first few months, then Shopify came along and picked up the monthly sponsorship on GitHub Sponsor, and it has been great. I've had the time to do this correctly, stay as close to the spec as possible, keep on top of developments in asynchronous syscall land, the IO Uring stuff. I owe a lot to these two companies, and I want to say to companies out there, there is room in my heart and bank account for you two. It's as easy as hitting that sponsor button on GitHub.com. Now, how do we make sure an HTTP implementation is correct? For HTTP 1, you don't. There is no widely accepted HTTP 1 compliance suite. There are a few commercial ones, but nothing official, and certainly nothing maintained. But it's okay, it's not like HTTP 1 is the protocol most widely used between reverse proxies and backends. It's not like it's a text-based protocol with a ton of edge cases, a lot of which have resulted in security vulnerabilities like request smuggling, response smuggling, header smuggling, etc. As for HTTP2, again, nothing official, but there is H2 spec, 8,000 lines of Go code testing various aspects of the RFCs that define HPAC, the binary header encoding format, and HTTP2 itself. It's just a binary, it connects to whichever address you give it, and sends a bunch of HTTP2 frames, and checks that your server behaves the way it should, like a reset the connection if it receives a frame that's too big, etc. And H2 spec has been really useful, but it is based on the older RFC 7540, not the newer RFC 9113. It runs sequentially for some reason, and the timeout can't be lower than one second, so if 90 tests are failing, then it takes at least 90 seconds to run. Uh, JUnit XML reporting is broken. I used a fork to fix that for a while, but after fighting with it for a bunch, I just decided to port it to Rust. Because if I had those test cases in Rust, then sure, I could generate a binary just like H2 spec that connects over TCP to whichever address you give it. If I could, could be a drop-in replacement for H2 spec, but, but I could also generate unit tests that take a connection implementation and then have everything run in memory and in parallel. And I would get to use cargo next tests to run the tests and generate reports. And that would make me very, very happy. And because I don't have to finish Fluke by the end of this sentence, No, thank you. Uh, thanks to continued funding, and because correctness is the first goal, performance being the second, I decided to do it right. So I started porting test cases from H2 spec to Rust using, uh, instead of Go's debug HTTP2 framer, Fluke's own HTTP2 types and parser powered by NOM, and it's been great. The HTTPWG crate exports one public function per test case. Those functions are async, they accept a connection, they return a result, and that means in my HTTP implementation, I can write unit tests that call those functions and get the whole suite for free, integrated with the Rust unit test machinery. Other Rust HTTP implementations could do that too if they wanted. Similarly, I can make a binary crate that has a catalog of all these functions and is able to establish TCP connections and run the tests you've selected against those connections so we can test any server just like the H2 spec binary does. But one thing I don't want to have to do is to manually add unit tests to Fluke every time I add new test cases in HTTP WG. Similarly, I don't want to have to update the catalog and the binary crate every time. Ideally, there would be a mechanism such that I could mark those functions as test cases, and from Fluke, I would be able to generate unit tests programmatically, one per case. And from the binary, I would be able to have a tree of test suites and groups and cases so that it can be filtered at runtime and reported neatly as JUnit XML or something. But there isn't such a mechanism. I couldn't find a way to do it in Rust that isn't cursed. And so I want to present my latest abomination, but also uh, review other ideas I've had and discarded because I deem them unfit for purpose. 
But first, let's hear a word from today's sponsor. Like 5% of adults worldwide, I suffer from depression. Depression makes it hard to form long-lasting bonds with others because it makes getting out of the house feel like climbing the Everest. Depression can also make it harder to get a good education because regular physical attendance at a university already costs so much, there's barely any energy left for actual learning. Luckily, the folks at Brilliant thought about people like me. They've hired teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, and other prestigious places to design high-quality courses to learn computer science and math interactively. Answer a few questions about your interests and your daily objectives, and Brilliant will come up with a personalized learning path you can follow at your own rhythm from wherever, including the floor. Because Brilliant courses let you play with concepts firsthand, information is absorbed that much better by your brain compared to watching lecture videos. Brilliant courses are accessible for learners of any level, in any situation. If I can do it, you can do it too. What are you waiting for? To try everything Brilliant has to offer, visit brilliant.org slash faster than live or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. My solution is code generation. I learned it from my days writing Go. In my developer journey, I went from C to Java to my own language that I compiled to C to Ruby for money uh, to Lua and MoonScript and JavaScript for the HIO desktop app. And I got so frustrated with Electron's native APIs that I started investing heavily in Go, both for server-side tasks like generating game patches and client-side tasks like applying game patches. I have feelings about Go like you have feelings about an old flatmate that kind of sucked, right? Nobody needs to call the police, but if you tell me you're moving in with him, I feel like I should warn you. Hence the few pieces I've written over the years about Go. Anyway, in Go, because the language is so small and beautiful, often, especially in the pre-generics era, whenever you wanted to do anything the slightest bit complicated, you had to resort to code generation. Kubernetes, an enormous pile of Go, does humongous amounts of code generation. But in Rust, we tend to try not to. Rust has had generics for a while, so there was never a need to generate different variants of a struct. For example, you just instantiate it. Uh, Rust has had macros for a while, not text macros like in C, not templates like in C++, but macros that manipulate tokens. For the simple stuff, you have macros by example, also called declarative macros, where you define input arguments and the shape of the output, and the compiler performs expansion until there's nothing more to expand. And then we have procedural macros, which are essentially compiler plugins, sort of, because they are Rust code that get compiled into a dynamic library, loaded up by Rusty at compile time, and they get token stream as an input, and they get to transform that token stream however they want. That's how you're able to derive the serialized and deserialized traits from survey on your own structs. The proc macro in survey derive gets a stream of tokens corresponding to your structure definition, then it parses that into an abstract syntax tree using the syncrate, which gives it a more structured view of your struct definition, no pun intended, and from there it can output tokens for impl blocks for serialize and deserialize. And if you're thinking, hold on a minute, does that mean that every derived macro has to parse a token stream into an AST independently using a Rust parser that's a third-party crate and not the parser used by the compiler, then the answer is yes, unfortunately. And if you're thinking, surely there must be a better way, there is introspection, and it was going to be presented at RustConf, but then through a series of unfortunate events involving the author of the same crate, that didn't happen. So yeah, I'm not salty. I'm okay. That's okay. But you may also be thinking proc macros actually sound great specifically for HTTPWG test because you could just annotate every test case with a proc macro attribute, which would call a proc macro of your own design. And then at compile time, you'd get to generate some other code that like adds these functions to a sort of global registry. And then no, that does not work for two reasons. First, uh, let's assume we can build such a registry with that method. We end up having a tree of test suites and groups and cases that would only be suitable for the binary, because that one only needs to enumerate test cases at runtime. But for Fluke's unit tests, we need to enumerate test cases at compile time. And that gets complicated, because that theoretical proc macro is called from the HTTPWG crate, not from the Fluke crate. So yeah, it has access to the cases, the registry slash catalog slash index, but it can't generate any code for Fluke. The best thing it can do is generate another macro that Fluke can then invoke so that unit tests are generated in Fluke's code base. That's actually what I'm doing right now, and I'm exporting such a macro, but I'm not generating this macro with another proc macro because, reason number two, proc macros are not supposed to be stateful. 
that proc macro would be called independently for each test case, but its output should be one single macro with a list of all cases. So it would need to store somewhere a list of contexts from all the times it's been called, and the last time it's called, read that list back and use it to generate the gen tests macro. That would interact very poorly with Cargo's own caching mechanisms. I don't even want to think about the failure modes. Proc macros should ideally be pure functions, and that's it. I mean, some prop macros query databases, but who's counting? If all the test cases were in a single file, then we could do something. But A, I don't want to, and B, I refuse to have that much code parsed by the syncrate every time my test suite is built, when all I really need is the module structure and list of functions that fit a particular signature. Also, proc macros are known to slow down the build process for a very good reason. They need to be compiled as a library before your actual code can be compiled, and they usually have to parse the entire token stream, and they're built without optimizations by default as a trade-off between time spent compiling the proc macro and time spent running the proc macro. So if you have a lot of code, it can get really inefficient. Maybe in the future we can like use the crane lift backend to build proc macros with optimizations, but faster, or we'll finally ship proc macros as WebAssembly bytecode that was optimized ahead of time, like what proved you could do. But for now, I'm staying away from them as much as I can. So enter RustDoc. RustDoc is the tool that generates documentation for Rust crates, including the standard library. On top of generating HTML you can view in your browser, it's also able as an experimental feature to generate JSON. It's not exactly an AST, it's more like a tree of items, like module definitions, function definitions, type definitions, with enough detail to generate your own HTML docs, for example. So doc comments get preserved, you get span information, the file in line number where something's defined. It's precise enough that you can use it to, for example, compare two versions of a crate and check if the public interface changed in a breaking way. That ships in a tool you can use today, it's cargo sender checks. And so I started wondering, if I ask Rustock to generate JSON for the crate that has all my test cases, will it give me enough information to generate a macro that generates unit tests? and to generate a catalog of test cases that can be inspected and filtered and ran at runtime? And the answer is yes. It was pretty easy, actually. I wrote all this in a plane with no internet connection, no GitHub Copilot, only offline versions of the crate documentations and Rust documentation, which you can open at any time by running Rust up doc, by the way. You can find the full code in Fluke's repository, but basically the idea is as follows. Step one, run Rust doc, set the environment variable Rust bootstrap to one. Why? Because the JSON output is experimental, so you're only supposed to use it from nightly, but I don't want to install a separate toolchain just for that, so I'm doing a little crime instead that is normally reserved for bootstrapping Rust C, but that in practice a lot of people use to just get that one nightly feature on Rust stable. Step two, parse Rust docs outputs with survey, uh, which uses proc macros. We'll, we'll see why that's not actually an issue. There's probably a crate with types for Rust docs output, but I was on a plane, so I just threw a couple structs together. It's Pretty simple, you get an index of items like modules, functions, impl blocks, those items have a unique ID, and some of them have children referred to by their ID, that's it. Pretty simple stuff. Step three, generate a Rust declarative macro, also known as macro by example, using the information we got from Rust doc, pipe that into Rust FMT and write it to disk. That's it, that's the whole trick. So. I said we usually avoid code generation in Rust. One of the main exceptions to that rule is bindgen, which parses C, C++ headers and generates Rust bindings. Similarly, the Windows crate parses WinRT definitions and generate Rust code. Uh, and I'm sure other crates do their own code gen. And the issue I often have with these is that they insist on shipping the code generator instead of the generated code, which means Every time you do a cold build from a dependent, in Bindgen's case, first off, you need to have libclang installed, then it parses all the headers, then it generates all the Rust code, then it compiles all that. That's just a lot of extra dependencies and time spent building everything for bindings that seldom change. In the case of the HTTP2 specs, I know I'm adding a test, right? I can just rerun CodeGen. I even added a pre-commit git hook that checks that you've generated CodeGen, and it also run in CI in case I get naughty contributors that disable git hooks. And the result is super neat. Code generation is really fast because it operates from Rust docs JSON output, which is a lot less information than the full token stream of all the source of all the test cases. Running Rust doc repeatedly is pretty fast because it takes advantage of uh, Cargo's caching. The, the generated crate HTTPWG macros has exactly one dependency, export one macro, everything is nice and fast. It just works great. I can add a new suite by creating a Rust module, a new group by creating a nested Rust module, a new case by just adding a pub function with the right signature and rerunning code gen. All cases run in parallel really fast with cargo next test. And I'm looking forward to shipping a binary one can run instead of h2spec in the future because this technique allows for that.
I like shipping generated code, especially when it doesn't depend on the build environment. There is a case for running bindgen from a build script, the build.rs file. If the binding is platform dependent, like if you have different headers from different operating system or different versions of the libraries, then okay, yeah. But if that's not the case, consider just generating code and shipping that because life is too short for long builds, right? Thanks for watching and as usual, take care. Thank <laughs> you.